Hello, fifth grade, and welcome to unit one, week four of language arts. We're going to go ahead and start with our guided practice, or sorry, with our vocabulary, and then we're going to get into our spelling words, our notes, and our stories. All right, your first vocabulary word for this week is the word captivated. If you are captivated, you are influenced by art or skill. The actors captivated the audience. When have you been captivated? So when you're captivated, you're very impressed, you're very uh, taken aback by something that you're watching happen. And what's what you're usually watching is someone who has a very particular skill. So an artist or <clears throat> an actor. Your second word is the word claimed. Something that's claimed is declared as one's own. So when you claim something, you're saying that it belongs to you. The girl claimed the backpack. When was the time you claimed something? So think of a time maybe you had lost something and it ended up in the lost and found box. You had to go and claim it. <clears throat> Your third word is the word devices. Things that are made or invented for certain purposes are devices. The new devices help us find our way to a new place. What are some types of devices? So think about phones or think about uh, the GPS that you might have in, in you know, your family's car to help you navigate and find places. Those are devices that are made for a specific purpose. Your next word is the word enthusiastically. <clears throat> Something done enthusiastically is done with excitement. I enthusiastically prepared for the game. When have you behaved enthusiastically at school? So it's just a really big fancy word that means you did something when you were really excited or in a really excited way. Your fifth word is the word passionate. When you are passionate about something, you have a very strong feeling about it. <clears throat> we are passionate about nature. How do you know what you are passionate about? So it's something that you have strong feelings about. It may be something that you care about a lot or something that um, means a lot to you. Patents is your next word. Patents are papers from the government that give a person or company the right to be the only one to make or sell new inventions of a certain for a certain number of years. So a patent is basically you saying officially that I'm the person that invented this and the government tells you, okay, you're the only one who's allowed to make this thing for this certain amount of time. They were given a patent for their airplane. So maybe the particular kind of airplane that they built, they were given a patent for it to say that no one else can copy their design for a certain amount of years. And our question form, why are patents important? <clears throat> Number seven is the word breakthrough. A breakthrough is an important advance. So when you uh, think about when scientists or inventors are stuck on something and then they figure it out. They solve whatever the problem was. They've made a breakthrough. So the scientists had a breakthrough in their research. How might you feel if you had a breakthrough? <coughs> and your last vocabulary word for this week is the word envisioned. If you envisioned something, you imagined what might happen in the future. So it's like picturing it. I envisioned how our new house would look. What have you envisioned happening at school? All right, next let's take a look at your spelling words for this week. Now this week's spelling words are focusing on R-controlled vowels. So R-controlled vowels are basically any time the letter R comes after a vowel, we call this an R-controlled vowel. We can also call this as the bossy R. Now some R-controlled vowel, vowels can make the same sound. For example, the sound of er can be represented or written as E-R, I-R, or U-R. They will all make kind of a similar sound. Other R-controlled vowels could be R, air, or, and er. So basically, R-controlled vowels make you sound like a pirate the whole time you're saying them. They have a very strong R sound in them. <coughs> so you can have R, such as in, like in the words car and march. You can have air like in the word air and chair. 
you can have the or sound like born or fort and the er sound such as shirt or first. Let's go ahead and read through your words. Number one is heart. Number two is swear. Number three is a board. Number four is squares. Number five is swore. Number six is chart. Number seven is scorn. Number eight is starch. Number nine is source. Number 10 is fair. Number 11 is barge. Number 12 is thorn. Number 13 is marsh. Number 14 is force. Number 15 is harsh. <clears throat> Number 16 is scarce. Number 17 is coarse. Number 18 is flare. Number 19 is coarse. Now this is a different kind of coarse. The first one, C-O-A-R-S-E, means rough, like a rough texture. And number 19 course could be like a path like a that you follow or like a golf course or a class could also be referred to as a course. Number 20 is sword. Number 21 is soothe. Number 22 is prove. Number 23 is hoof. <clears throat> number 24 is uproar. And number 25 is gorge. Okay, next let's get into our comprehension skill and strategy. So here we're going to be talking about sequence and asking and answering questions. So sequence or time order is a way that an author will organize or show and present information to you. Understanding that sequence helps the reader identify and remember important events in the story. So what happens at the beginning, middle, and end. Uh, words and phrases will pop up throughout the reading that'll help you figure out what time frame they're talking about. So if it says years later or in the year, and they'll give you, you know, a particular year, these help you to organize the story in your head and put it in sequence or time order. Now, to help build your comprehension and make you get, help you gain a better understanding of what you're reading, you can ask questions before, during, and after the reading of a particular passage. So after a page or a paragraph, or even after reading your entire section, you can ask yourself questions like, what is the main idea of this section? What does the author want me to know about you know, whatever the topic is, and so on. These help you really think and analyze your reading so that you gain a better understanding of the message that the author is trying to get across to you. Now your genre for this week is biographical texts so, or biographies. Now biography is a true story about someone's life, but it's written by another person. It's not written by that person themselves. If it was, that would be called an autobiography. But a biography is the story of someone else's life uh, that's written by an author. So it usually tells either about a famous person or maybe an ordinary person who did some really exciting or influential things. It'll usually center on one person's life and how they contributed to the world. So were they uh, a great peace activist? Were they someone who helped the needy? Were they uh, a famous athlete? All of these things, all of these people could be the subject of a biography. And a biography doesn't necessarily need to be about someone who's passed away. It could be some, about someone who's still living presently. Now, your vocabulary strategy for this week is going to focus on Greek roots. So we're going to look at some of the roots here, their meaning, and words that they've been used in. So your Greek root, uh, electron, uh, translates or means amber. Now, the reason it means amber, and I put slash electricity, is because amber was a material that if you rubbed it, it created static electricity. So that's where we got the word electric or electromagnetic or electricity itself. Our next root is the root pathos. So pathos refers to feelings or emotions. That's where we get the words sympathy or empathy. Next, we have techni. Techni means art or skill, like technology or technical. If you see that root in a word, that's what they're referring to. 
And the root graph or gram means to write. So a photograph is basically a picture, right? Or a drawing with light. A telegram is something that's written that travels a long distance. Now we know our next route is the, is the route tele. Tele means at a distance. So a telescope helps you to see something that is at a distance, it's far away. A television helps you view things from a distance. And then we have the root scope, which means to see. So telescope means it helps you to see something that's far away. Our next route is astra. Astra means star. So astronomy or an astronomer are the study of stars or, the, or someone who studies stars in outer space. Our next route is phone. Phone talks about sound. So if, we're, if I ask you to spell a word phonetically, that means I'm asking you to spell it exactly the way it sounds, not the way it's supposed to be written. Or a telephone <clears throat> helps you hear sounds and transfer sounds over long distances. Next, we have bio, which is related to our genre, biography. Bio means life. So it's a biography is the written story of someone's life. Biology is the study of living things. And our last route that we're going to look at today is crone. Crone uh, means time. So chronology, like sequence, tells you about things in order. Something that's written in chronological order means it's written in the order that it happened, first, second, last. <clears throat> Chronic means something that's going on over a long period of time. And that takes us to the end of our uh, vocab strategy. Next, we're going to hop into our grammar notes. And here we're talking about sentences. So that's the general topic. We're going to talk about a lot of different things related to sentences here. Now, first, I want to remind you about certain parts uh, of sentences and what they're called, because we're going to be referring to them throughout our notes. Now, a clause is a group of words with a subject and a verb. You can have an independent clause that's a complete thought all by itself. You can also call an independent clause a simple sentence. So an independent clause can be, we play outside. It gives you a subject and it gives you a verb, we play. A dependent clause <clears throat> is not a complete thought and it can't stand alone as a sentence. So think of this as a sentence fragment. So if I say, after we finish our homework, you might look at that and you say, okay, what happens after we finish our homework? So you see that it's missing the rest of the thought. So independent clause is a simple sentence. Dependent clause is, is a sentence fragment. It's missing a piece. Now, a complex sentence has an independent clause and one or more dependent clauses all rolled up into one sentence. So it's a sentence that contains two related clauses that are joined by a conjunction other than the words and, but, or, or. <clears throat> now those were our focus last week. This week, we're going to focus on some different ones. So our first example <clears throat> is when we go to the beach, comma, we can build a sandcastle. So when you begin a sentence with what we call a subordinating conjunction. And we're going to talk about those in a moment. And then a dependent clause, you need to put a comma after that dependent clause. So when we go to the beach is a dependent clause. It, it doesn't stand alone as a sentence by itself. It needs something else. So if I'm beginning with what we call a subordinating conjunction and a dependent clause, I need to put a comma after it before I put my independent clause, we can build a sandcastle. <clears throat> now I can say we can build a sandcastle by itself. That's a complete thought. We is my subject, what can we do? Build, build a sandcastle. So that's independent. Now you can switch up the order. If you start with your independent clause and your subordinating conjunction is sitting in the middle of your sentence, you don't need that comma anymore. So I can switch the order of the sentence and say, we can build a sandcastle when we go to the beach. <clears throat> so notice all I did was switch their places. 
and then I didn't need that comma anymore. Now we talked about coordinating conjunctions. We said coordinating conjunctions are connecting words and they help to connect or join two words, phrases, or clauses. They join words of the same group or grammatical rank or importance. So two nouns or two verbs or two independent clauses and so on. The coordinating conjunctions and, but, and, or can be used to create a compound sentence. That was our focus last week. And we know that a compound sentence contains two or more related sentences joined by either and, or, or but. These three words have different functions. And joins ideas, but shows a change in thought. And or offers a choice. <clears throat> now let's talk about those subordinating conjunctions we were just mentioning. Subordinating conjunctions tell where, when, why, or how. Some subordinating conjunctions are the words after, because, if, unless, while, until, when, and before. So you can find these either at the beginning or the middle of a complex sentence. So remember, we said a complex sentence has an independent clause and one or more dependent clauses that are squashed together and connected by one of those conjunctions. So I listed a few examples here. Subordinating conjunctions tell where, when, or why, or how. So one of our words is after. Now, if I begin with after in my dependent clause, then I have to put a comma. After we finished our homework, comma, we can play outside. Now, if I switch the order and I began with my independent clause and I said, we can play outside after we finish our homework, I don't need that comma anymore. So remember, the only time you need a comma after that dependent clause is if you're starting your sentence with that subordinating conjunction and the independent clause. If that's the way you're starting it, then you need the comma. Because of the rain, comma, we couldn't go to the beach. If you finish your chores, comma, you can watch a movie. Unless we buy apples, comma, we can't make apple pie. While I read the story, comma, my sister drew pictures. Or while I read the story, my sister drew pictures. Until the rain stops, comma, we'll play board games. When we write neatly, comma, our teacher is happy. And our last example here, before we saw the lightning, comma, we heard thunder. Now, some subordinating conjunctions are called relative adverbs and relative pronouns. <clears throat> These are used to join independent clauses and dependent clauses. So our relative adverbs are the words where, when, and why. And our relative pronouns are the words who, whom, whose, which, and that. So where, when, and why describe where will describe a place. So I know the town where you live. That uses the word where, and it's talking about a location or a place. I remember when my friend would mail me letters. That describes a time. Or she told me the reason why she left the team. So that describes a reason. <clears throat> so those three relative adverbs uh, tell you, refer to either a place, they describe a time, or they describe a reason. Now our relative pronouns, who, whom, whose, which, and that, all have different purposes as well. The author who wrote the book is German. So this relates to people in the subject of the sentence. So the author who wrote the book, this is about that subject. <clears throat> the letter should be addressed to whom. This relates to people, but this is in the object part or the predicate part of the sentence. So who is for people when you're talking about someone that's in the subject of your sentence and whom is when you're talking about someone who's in the predicate of your sentence. The person whose house is at the end of the street has a cat. So whose is a possessive, it shows ownership. So the person whose house is at the end of the street has a cat, it's showing ownership of the house. This is the cake which Mary made. This relates to when you're talking about animals or inanimate objects. So that means not living things. So when you're referring to animals or things, you use which. 
September is the month that classes start. <clears throat> that can refer to people, animals, or things. So classes are a thing, right? September is the month that classes start. So these are our relative pronouns and our relative adverbs. All right, next, let's get into our, <clears throat> our reading. Now, our story for this week is called, is a biography, and it's called The Boy Who Invented TV. Genre, biography, The Boy Who Invented TV, by Kathleen Krull, illustrated by Greg Couch. Essential question. How does technology lead to creative ideas? Read about how Philo Farnsworth came up with an invention that would change the world. The story of Philo Farnsworth. Life before Philo. Imagine what it was like growing up on a farm in the American West of 1906. With electricity rare out in the country, chores took up most of your day. No refrigerators, no cars, few phones, hardly any indoor bathrooms. Long distances separated you from friends and relations. Meeting up with others took some effort. You rode a horse or walked. There were trains, but riding or even seeing one was a big deal. Getting news was another challenge. What government leaders were doing in Washington, the latest in the arts and sciences, whether sports teams were winning or losing, new information of any kind. It trickled in haphazardly by mail. Not many people had books, and libraries were few and far between. It was all a bit lonely. What about fun? Movies? No. Radio? No. It was only on military ships. There was music if you played your own instruments. There were no malls to go hang out at. When you had enough money saved up to buy a bicycle or roller skates, you ordered from the wish book the Sears Roebuck mail order catalog. And there was no television. That's right, no TV. In 1906, inside a log cabin on a farm in Utah, a boy was born who would change things. His name was Philo Taylor Farnsworth. No sooner did Philo Farnsworth learn to talk than he asked a question, then another, and another. His parents answered as best they could. Noticing Philo's interest in anything mechanical, his father took the three-year-old boy to see a train at a station. At first, Philo was afraid this huge, noisy thing might be a monster. But the nice engineer invited the boy up into the cab with him, explaining a bit about how steam-powered trains worked. That night, Philo sat at the kitchen table and drew detailed pictures of what went on inside the motor of a train. Two new machines captivated Philo as he grew up. One was a hand-cranked telephone, purchased by a neighbor. Holding the phone one day, hearing the voice of his beloved aunt, six-year-old Philo got goosebumps. After all, she lived a long ways away. Another neighbor brought a hand-cranked phonograph to a dance. Music swirling out of a machine. It was almost impossible to believe. These things seemed like magic to me, Philo said later. Besides being incredibly clever, the inventions brought people together in whole new ways. Philo's father shared his wonder. On clear summer nights as they lay in the grass and gazed at the stars, his father told him about Alexander Graham Bell and the telephone, Thomas Edison and the phonograph, inventors, these became Philo's heroes. Away on a temporary job, his father appointed Philo, the oldest of five children, the man in the family. Philo was eight. His many chores included feeding the pigs, milking and grazing the cow, fetching wood for the stove. He did get his own pony, Tippy. It was also a sort of reward to skip school for a while. Bullies there teased him about his unusual name. Shy and serious, Philo didn't fight back. 
he found it far more appealing to practice reading with his grandmother's Sears Roebuck catalog. It had toys as well as cameras, alarm clocks, and machines that used a new, invisible source of power. Electricity, it was called. In his spare time, Philo raised lambs and sold them. When he had enough money saved up, he visited his grandmother to pick a bicycle out of her catalog. But somehow, she talked him into ordering a violin instead. Philo did love the sound of music, its orderly rhythms. And even at age ten, he dreamed of fame. Maybe he could find it by creating music, like what he heard on the neighbor's phonograph. Soon he was performing in dance bands, making five dollars every Friday night. Playing the violin was one more thing for the bullies to tease him about. Then one day, Philo fought back, and the teasing ended. Trying for a better life, the Farnsworths moved from Utah to an Idaho farm with fields of beets and potatoes. Eleven-year-old Philo drove one of their covered wagons, carrying a crate of piglets, a cage of hens, his violin, and their new prize possession a phonograph. Arriving in the Snake River Valley, he noticed something up in the air. Power lines. Their new home was wired for electricity. A generator ran the lights and water heater, the haystacker and grain elevator, and other farm equipment. And up in the attic was another welcome surprise. A shelf of old popular science magazines, with thrilling articles about magnetism, electricity, and those new magic boxes, radios. Philo promptly claimed this as his bedroom. His chores began before dawn, but he trained himself to wake an hour early so he could switch on the light and read in bed. Any spare money he had went to buy more magazines. That's when he saw the word television for the first time. It meant a machine that was something like a radio, only it sent pictures instead of sounds. It didn't actually exist yet, but scientists were racing to invent one. The electric generator broke down a lot, and repairs were costly. Each time the repairman came, Philo bombarded him with questions. After yet another breakdown, Philo set out to fix the machine himself. He took it apart, cleaned it, put it back together, and pressed the on button. It worked. Philo's father was enormously proud of him. From then on, he was the Farnsworth's electrical engineer. Philo tinkered with broken motors, reels of wire, old tools. He devised gadgets to hook up to the generator, anything to make his chores easier, like installing lights in the barn. His least favorite thing was washing clothes, hours of standing while pushing and pulling the lever that swished the water around the wash tub. So he attached a motor with pulleys to the lever to make it churn on its own, leaving him extra time to read. When he was 13, Philo entered a contest sponsored by Science and Invention magazine. Using what he'd learned about magnets, he pictured an ignition lock that would make the new Model T Fords harder to steal. When he won the contest, Philo spent the prize money on his first pair of proper long pants. Wearing boyish short pants at the Friday dances was just plain embarrassing. Philo went on investigating television. An article called Pictures That Fly Through the Air stimulated him. Scientists were having no luck. So far, their ideas resulted in crude mechanical devices that used whirling disks and mirrors. Philo doubted any disk could whirl fast enough to work. Much better to do the job electronically, to harness electrons, those mysterious invisible particles that traveled at the speed of light. One bright sunny day, 14-year-old Philo plowed the potato fields. It was the best chore for thinking, out in the open country by himself, back and forth, back and forth. The plow created rows of overturned earth, 
he looked behind him at the lines he was carving, perfectly parallel. Then he almost fell off the plow seat. All his thoughts fused together. Instead of seeing rows of dirt, he saw a way to create television, breaking down images into parallel lines of light, capturing them and transmitting them as electrons, then reassembling them for a viewer. If it was done quickly enough, people's eyes could be tricked into seeing a complete picture instead of lines. Capturing light in a bottle was how he thought of it, using electricity, not a machine with moving parts inside. Philo's grin was wide. He told the idea to his father, who tried to understand, but couldn't keep up with his son. In the autumn, Philo started high school, riding horseback four miles each way. Mr. Tolman, the senior chemistry teacher, noticed that his freshmen devoured books the way other students ate popcorn. He started tutoring Philo, coming in early and leaving late. One day, Mr. Tolman passed by a study hall and heard loud talking. Philo's latest hero was Albert Einstein, with his controversial new theory of relativity. Now Philo stood at the front of the room, enthusiastically explaining it to his classmates step by step. Usually Philo spoke little with a halting voice, but when he could share his knowledge of science, he was a different boy. Philo had been aching to discuss the idea he'd gotten in the potato field with someone who might understand. One day he finally told Mr. Tolman. All over the blackboard he drew diagrams of his television. His teacher was boggled. Philo ripped a page out of the notebook he always kept in his shirt pocket. He scribbled a diagram of an all-electric camera, the kind of converter he envisioned, an image dissector, he called it. Mr. Tolman pointed out that it would take a lot of money to build such a thing. The only way he could think of helping was to encourage Philo to go on to college. But Philo was forced to quit college at 18 after his father died. By then the family had moved back to Utah, to the town of Provo, and Philo supported them by working all sorts of jobs in nearby Salt Lake City. His favorite one was repairing radios. Though commercial radio broadcasts had started four years earlier, Philo couldn't believe in 1924 how many people still hadn't heard one. On weekends, he organized radio parties so his friends could gather around one of the bulky wooden cabinets and listen to the new stations. Pem Gardner, the girl next door, was interested in radio and also in Philo. Wasn't it funny, Philo remarked to Pem, how they liked to watch the radio even though there was nothing to see. Radio was such a fine way to bring folks together, and television, he sensed, would be even better. Thanks to his obsession with television, Philo had already lost one girlfriend, who called him too much of a dreamer. But Pem cheered him on. Now what he needed was money. He grew a mustache to look older, bought a new blue suit, and started to call himself Phil. He met two California businessmen, and over dinner one night, he took them through a step-by-step -step explanation of his image dissector, a camera tube that would dissect an image into a stream of electrons, converting them into pulses of electrical current. A receiver would capture the current, then convert it back into points of light, the original image. As he talked, he got more and more passionate. After scanning images line by line, just like rows in a potato field, this machine would beam them into homes. That was the best thing about television, he said. It would let families and whole communities share the same stories. By making people less ignorant of one another, he went on, it would teach and inspire, maybe even lead to world peace. The two businessmen exchanged looks, then agreed to put up $6,000 so Philo could build the first model. They gave him a year to make it work. 
Philo hit upon a way to work 24 hours a day. He set himself problems to solve while sleeping. He filed for several government patents that would protect his ideas for the next 17 years. It was important to him to keep control, to get credit. On their wedding night, he turned to Pem. I have to tell you, there is another woman in my life, and her name is Television. Pem helped out. Their first lab was their dining room table in Hollywood. Pem learned to use a precision welder to make tube elements. Everything had to be built from scratch. When they needed a break, they went to one of the new talking movies. Finally, they got the lights, wires, and tubes to work in unison. But at the first demonstration, Philo forgot one item. He failed to take the power surge into account. The entire image dissector exploded. Pem, who took notes about everything, labeled this experiment Bang, Pop, Sizzle. Still, Philo was able to find new investors who gave him another year. At his new lab in San Francisco, Philo met the deadline. In 1927, a small group of people watched as the first image in history flickered on a TV. He said, that's it, folks. We've done it. There you have electronic television. That first image was not fancy. It was a straight line, blurry and bluish. Later, he was able to show a dollar sign and then the motion of cigarette smoke. The first person to be televised was his true love, Pam, who didn't know she was on camera and had her eyes closed. The following year, in front of a crowd of reporters, 22-year-old Philo Farnsworth announced the invention of television. That night, he was behind the wheel of a borrowed car. He and Pam were heading home after catching a movie with another couple. They stopped to buy the San Francisco Chronicle from a newsboy, and there was a photo of Philo holding his invention. The article praised a young genius for creating a revolutionary light machine. Pam and his friends read it aloud, bouncing up and down, yelling. Philo was silent, but a big smile crossed his face. He was a real inventor, like his heroes, someone who connected people a shaper of the world to come. Thanks to him, the future would include TV. All right, that takes us to the end of our weekly story. If you guys have any questions, let me know. Otherwise, have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye-bye.